everybody, Jessica here. A few weeks have passed since we planted our tiniest of seeds, the mustard seeds. You remember, these were the smallest seeds. And we talked about how even something very small, given the right circumstances, can grow to be something quite remarkable. And I wanted to show you how remarkable our tiny little seeds have become. Only a few weeks have passed, and look what's happened. We have, we have growth. Now these definitely aren't the large trees that we read about in the Bible where the birds were making nests, but they certainly have grown larger than the tiny seed. And it just took the right soil, the right water, and the right light, and this is what we have now. I'm going to be putting these in some larger pots so the roots have a little more room to grow and I have a feeling these are going to get even bigger. But it just goes to show you that the smallest things can become something quite great. See you later. Bye! Then John's disciples came and asked him, How is that we and the Pharisees fast often? but your disciples do not fast. Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk clothes on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment making the tail worse. Neither do people pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. The wine will run out and the wine skin will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins and the both are preserved. The image of wineskins that Jesus uses in his parable is less familiar in our day. Wine was made by crushing grapes in a wine press with the juice flowing to a wine vat. In the warm climate of Palestine, grape juice would begin to ferment very quickly. After the initial fermentation, the wine was strained to separate out sediment. After four to six days, it was poured into clay jars lined with pitch or animal skins for storage and further fermentation. Wine skins were made of whole tanned goat skins with the legs and tail cut off and sealed and the neck tied off once the wine had been poured in. Wine needs to ferment without access to oxygen as the yeast consumes the natural sugars in the grapes. A byproduct of the fermentation is carbon dioxide, which in modern wine escapes through an airlock, but in the wine skin it would seep through the seams of the neck and limb openings. The whole large skin would be bulging, almost to bursting, as the carbon dioxide forces its way out during the next two to four months of fermentation. The stretching process, in addition to the alcohol content of about 12%, would destroy the natural resiliency of the wineskin and its ability to contract and stretch again would be lost. Jesus' hearers would have understood the fermentation and the aging of leather and hence the meaning of the parable. New wine cannot be put into old wineskins lest the pressure burst the now inflexible skin and the wine would be lost. A new container, a new way of thinking and a new spirit is needed to contain the new things that Jesus Christ brings. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing, if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God 
at least they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised of my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. As it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus. And do you not understand these things? When Jesus turned water into wine at a wedding in Cana of Galilee, we learned that his ministry was about transformation. We looked at that about a month ago. And ever since then, we've been looking at what the process of transformation and spiritual growth looks like in the pages of the Bible. We know that it takes time, just like it takes time for a mustard seed to grow into its full potential and be able to have birds nest in its branches. We know that sometimes it takes being knocked to the ground to understand that we aren't the spiritual giants that we sometimes think we are, as Paul had to learn the hard way on the road to Damascus. We saw in the courage of Ananias that a sign of spiritual maturity is the ability to love our enemies. But one of the things that we haven't really looked at is what is needed both externally and internally to kick off the actual transformation process. So today I want to look at a couple of other passages to help fill in that gap. First up is a series of metaphors from Matthew 9, but they could just as easily be taken from Mark 2 or Luke 5 because the same metaphors are used in all three places in roughly the same context early on in Jesus' ministry. In all three places, Jesus is fielding a question on why his disciples don't fast like the Pharisees or the disciples of John the Baptist. Since fasting is what Jews did to signal mourning or repentance, Jesus' first answer is, nobody fasts at a wedding. Then he seems to shift gears and adds that if you sew a new piece of cloth onto an old garment, then the patch is going to shrink when you wash it and pull it away from the cloth and your patching is going to be no good. And if you put new wine in old wineskins, you'll burst the skin and lose the wine. If you watch the little video before this in the worship service, you'll understand how that process worked. The point of all three examples is that a new thing requires special care and attention. Sometimes that means setting aside the rules. So maybe you don't fast at the celebration of a new marriage. But it also means you can't just throw the new thing into something well established, or you're going to end up messing up both the new thing and the old thing. What isn't as clear in these, in the wineskins and the old cloth metaphors of Jesus, is the point of reference. And biblical scholars fall roughly into two camps on this. The more common one is that Jesus is talking about Judaism versus Christianity, that Judaism is somehow the old brittle skin and the new wine Jesus is offering is Christianity, this new faith that will go with it. That interpretation is an example of what we call supersessionism big word, but it means Christianity is better at Judaism, is better than Judaism. It supersedes it and moves in to take its place. So in that view, 
Christian faith supersedes Jewish faith. That's yet another example of how anti-Semitism creeps into Christianity and misunderstands what both Jesus and Paul taught in the pages of the Bible. As a reminder, there are no Christians in this story, not as we would define the term. Christianity as a faith apart from Judaism doesn't exist for more than a century after the story of the Bible closes. The interpretation I find most convincing is one articulated by the 16th century reformer John Calvin, which, if you know me, is rare because I am not a fan of John Calvin. <laughs> but here, he suggests that the new thing for which the rules need to bend and for which new cloth and new wineskin is needed is not Judaism, but rather Jesus' fledgling disciples and the process of spiritual growth that they have just left their jobs to follow Jesus and explore. To find support for that, consider the context. This passage comes at the very outset of Jesus' ministry in all three Gospels. And Jesus has just called Matthew from his tax booth, a detail that's the same in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. In all three places, the question about fasting isn't about whether Jews should fast. Jesus is being asked by the disciples of John the Baptist why they and the Jewish leadership have to fast while Jesus' disciples don't. In other words, we're all Jews, why are your disciples getting special treatment? Jesus is not advocating for replacing an old faith with a new one. He's saying that his disciples, whom he's just pulled from the ranks of uneducated fishermen and corrupt tax collectors, are so new to any religious practice that the containers for mature faith are unsuitable. The growth of these new folks not only will do harm to the container, the wineskin or the original cloak, those things are still perfectly suitable for mature wine and cloth, by the way, but it will ruin the newcomers as well. No one wins in those situations. Their time for fasting will come, he reminds them. It just isn't now, because they have yet to grow. On a practical level, that's an issue I've seen for decades, as churches in the U.S. have tried to grapple with the changing religious landscape and the fact that many people now come to the church without a background in Christian faith or, for that matter, with any faith at all. When I was on the staff of a 3,000-member church in Florida, I was charged with developing a new worship service for Saturday nights that would be an accessible point of entry for those unfamiliar with the church. There were very few traditional elements in that service, and we had sincere and heated debates about whether communion should be included there, because some believed it would be a stumbling block to those considering Christianity. Our debate about that wasn't about changing Christian faith or whether Christians should or shouldn't celebrate communion. It was about the container for that service and whether what I was creating left enough room and space for the stretching and pulling and questioning that naturally accompany spiritual growth. I've also seen it play out in Bible studies, where those who may not even own a Bible have tried to engage with those raised on its stories since childhood, often resulting in discussions that pull the new cloth apart from the old on the first wash and end up helping nobody. So interpreting the wineskin and the cloth metaphor as a reference to the newly minted disciples instead of to some new and separate faith that isn't going to exist for another hundred years or more makes much more sense to me especially given its context at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, right as he's called the disciples. If you put that concept back into the seed metaphor, it's like reminding people that if you're starting a plant from seed, you might want to keep it in the house until it has enough of a root system to survive being planted outdoors. We saw a couple of weeks ago that even Paul, who had risen through the religious ranks to become an expert in Jewish law, 
still had to go back to Tarsus for 12 years after his experience before he, was be, before he would be ready to be sent on his first missionary journey. But even with all of that, there's still a piece missing. The new wineskin is only needed for new wine, not water. What is it that changes the water into wine? Even if it's new wine, even if it's just starting that process, how does it get there? What makes a seed fertile enough to start growing roots in the first place? What is it that needs to happen inside of a person to jumpstart spiritual growth? That's where I think John's Gospel comes in. The particular illustration about wineskins and cloth doesn't occur in John like it does in the other Gospels. But there are some interesting parallels at roughly the same point in Jesus' ministry. In the first chapter of John, Jesus calls his first disciples. Next up in John 2, we get the wedding at Cana, where we talked about last month, the changing the water into wine, giving the message that his ministry is about transformation. Then in chapter 3, where you might expect the wineskins and the cloth story from the other Gospels, instead we have the story of Nicodemus. And Jesus tells Nicodemus that what is needed is a new womb for a new birth. Nicodemus, like Paul, is a Pharisee. But unlike Paul, Nicodemus is part of the Sanhedrin, the religious body in Israel that held political power in religious matters. It would be the Sanhedrin which was always led by the high priest, who would later put Jesus on trial, and who would authorize Paul to go to Damascus to arrest Jesus' followers. Nicodemus has been raised in the faith, and he has risen into the highest ranks as a religious leader. The context lets us know that he's a bit nervous about being seen with Jesus, because Nicodemus comes at night. But we should also remember that this is the Gospel of John, where everything is written on multiple levels. One of the key metaphors throughout John is the contrast between light and dark. The fact that Nicodemus comes at night is telling us that he felt he needed to speak to Jesus in secret, yes, but it's also John saying that Nicodemus is metaphorically in the dark. Unlike some of Jesus' other encounters with Pharisees, this one is amicable. Nicodemus addresses Jesus with respect by calling him rabbi, and what he presents isn't a question or a challenge. He's not throwing down a gauntlet. He's not accusing Jesus of something. He simply says, We know that you're a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Presumably, that we in we know means at least some of the other Pharisees and leaders are on board with that. Well, okay, so that's nice, but why are you here, Nicodemus? He doesn't say. And none of the other Gospels has this story or even mention Nicodemus at all to give us any more clues. All we have is John telling us that Nicodemus is literally and figuratively in the dark. And the metaphor for that becomes clear shortly. Jesus famously responds, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above or born again. It can be translated either way. That metaphor throws Nicodemus for a loop. The Pharisees were legal, ex ex <laughs> the Pharisees were legal experts, so it's easy for him to slip into a literal interpretation of Jesus' words, which he does making him sound pretty silly, actually. How can anyone be born again after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Come on, Nicodemus, you're sounding like a member of Congress. Jesus sets him straight. Spiritual birth, Nicodemus. We're talking spirit 
In a physical birth, you're born with water as your mother's water breaks. You need that. You kind of need to be physically born to have this conversation. But if you want to really see what's going on, you need an equivalent spiritual birth. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Nicodemus is still baffled. How can these things be? At which point Jesus sees that he's got his work cut out for him. Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Jesus clearly expected more than he was getting from the upper echelons of religious leadership. If Nicodemus wants to grow, he needs to put aside all the complexities of faith that he has learned and studied, the comfortable old cloth that he's been interpreting for others, and crawl into a new, limited, yet expandable space. There he will need to forget what he thinks he knows and become a spiritual embryo that can develop the capacity for spiritual sight, movement, and understanding. Over time, he will grow and reach the point where he can be born again. And with that new spiritual capacity, he will gradually become wine. The new wineskin will expand, the new swaddling clothes will be washed again and again, and he will be able to truly understand all that he learned before. We see in Paul that all of his training and study as a Pharisee and all the disciplined practice of his years of faith didn't need to be trashed. He just had to put all of those things aside for a while as he underwent a new birth in spiritual understanding. Once he had that new birth, which remember took over a decade, all his training and study came back in a rush, and with new eyes to see it, God could use him to change the world. For all the hoorah surrounding being born again in our culture, Jesus is not saying anything different to Nicodemus in John 3 than he said to his disciples back in Matthew 18, verses 3 and 4, when they were arguing about who was the greatest in God's kingdom. Jesus told them, Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Being born again is not about saying some magic words. And if we're, fortunate to have, if we're fortunate enough to have someone paying as much attention to our spiritual development as to our physical development as children, we typically won't have a dramatic knocked-off-your-horse moment later. It still takes time to mature, but we'll only need one wineskin and one piece of cloth because physical and spiritual maturity would all be happening at once. However old we are, whatever our station in life, we have to grow spiritually just as we did physically. And they both take time. You screw up in both ways. You have growing pains and all the rest of it. But we have to begin spiritually as well as physically at birth. And if it didn't happen at our actual birth, we got to have a new one so that we can start. If our spiritual growth didn't track with our, spirit, with our physical growth, if the learning of our minds outpaced the learning of our hearts, if we learn to judge but never to love, we will need a new birth, a spiritual birth. We don't yet belong with the nicely aged wine, or like Paul before his conversion, we can do more harm than good. We must find the humility to accept a new childhood of faith, to step back and learn from gentle souls like Ananias or humble fishermen like Peter. Even if we are wealthy and educated and a recognized leader in our field, we can just drop our nets and go, like Peter, James, and John did. We can grow into it naturally, 
like many of the prophets, and as it seems Ananias might have done. Or we can be hard-headed and self-important and wait to be knocked to the ground like Paul to understand. But if we never do that, if we're never born again, we're going to spend our lives in the dark. Amen. We return to God a portion of what has been given to us for God's work in our shared ministry. Friends and members are asked to prayerfully consider giving in support of Crawford's ministries and operations. You can give electronically by clicking the button in the weekly messenger or on our website, or you can mail a check to 34 Dick Street, Winchester, Mass., 01890. Thank you. Till all the jails are empty and all the bellies filled, till no one hurts or steals or lies, and no Will.
done and all things are made new. God has worked for us in tenement and mansion, in factory farm and mill, in boardroom and in billiard hall, in wards where time stands still. In Classrooms, church, and office, in shops or on the street, in every place where people thrive or starve or hide or meet. By sitting at a bedside to old pale trembling by speaking for the powerless against unjust demands by praying through our doing and singing though we fear by trusting that the seed we sow will bring God's harvest near God has work for us to do, God has work for us to do, till God's will is done and all things are made new. God has work for us, work for us to do, work for us to do. In out-of-the-way places of the heart, where your thoughts never think to wonder, this beginning has been quietly forming, waiting until you were ready to emerge. For a long time, it has watched your desire, feeling the emptiness growing inside you, noticing how you willed yourself un, still unable to leave what you had outgrown. It watched you play with the seduction of safety and the great promises that sameness whispered. Heard the waves of turmoil rise and relent. Wondered, would you always live like this? Then the delight, when your courage kindled and out you stepped onto new ground. Your eyes young again with energy and dream a path of plenitude opening before you. Though your destination is not yet clear, you can trust the promise of this opening. Unfurl yourself into the grace of beginning that is at one with your life's desire. Awaken your spirit to adventure. Hold nothing back. Learn to find ease in risk. Soon you will be home in a new rhythm, for your soul senses the world that awaits you.